Uh, next up, we have Jesse from Newton, the king of adaptive learning. I'm sorry, massively adaptive. Massively, yeah. right. It's really, that's a, that's a critical uh, modifier there. Um, yeah, so thank you guys for having me. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about massively adaptive education, and just, ma just adaptive education we'll do for now, um, uh, at Newton. Um, and, and specifically the data science behind it. Um, that's what I know best. Um, and uh, just following Jake's talk a little bit, like I can say as a hiring manager in data science that I think he has it spot on in terms of what, what I look for in, um, in data scientists come in to build data products, which is the, the, the main category that, we, that, we, that we're under. Um, we're a small enough company that we ask them to do some of the other ones, but that's the main value add that they, that they bring to the table. So, so first, some introductions. Um, hopefully, this is the boringest slide that I show you today um, with the most pensive photograph. Um, so this is me, Jesse St. Charles. My background, probably unsurprisingly, scientific software engineering, math stats, shocker. Um, my graduate work uh, was at School of Computer Science at Carnegie Mellon, um, doing analysis, inference, simulation of complex human systems. So this would be social networks, terror networks, uh, industrial systems, things like that. Um, and about three years ago, I became Newton's first data scientist and have been building the team ever since. And it's actually gotten quite large, as Matt noted before. Um, so let's talk about education a little bit. Um, so the problems in education uh, specifically stem from this, the industrial educational model, which has been Great, don't get me wrong, it, it, it's democratized access to education. Um, but it is one size fits all. Um, and to me, that means that everyone's underserved. Uh, additionally, the education process lacks uh, objective uh, grounding and uh, transparency into like, actually what's going on um, uh, in, in a very real way. Um, and finally, students are already generating all this data as they're interacting with these educational products, but they're just falling on the floor. We're not doing anything with it. Um, so so if, what if there was a way for us to take all that data that we're kind of missing out on and leverage it to do something about these problems in the industrial educational model? Um, and that's where Newton comes in. So we have what we call an adaptive learning platform, and it just sounds like jargon for right now, so let's break it down into the adaptive learning part. Um, what do we mean by that? So first, personalized learning experiences through content recommendations. Um, you get a little hint of someone going through content um, in this unique path. Um, and then we have transparency and empowerment through educational analytics, since we're already collecting a lot of data about students as they go through that, that uh, process. Um, and I'll talk more about those in a second. Um, now, the platform part is pretty straightforward. It's just, it means that we have, we're actually an API, and we, we're using that API to provide the above capabilities to any content partner that decides to work with us. Um, so, drilling in, so what, is, what does content recommendations mean exactly? So, it means given what a student knows and what they don't know, and specifically what they need to know, um, based on the, what's going on in the classroom, um, what piece of content would they be best served by experiencing next that would maximize their learning outcomes? Um, on the educational analytics side, there's a, a myriad of questions that, that, that various stakeholders in the education space want answered, but they just kind of had to guess at this uh, up, up till now. They've had to look at their grade book, and they've had to look at attendance records, and they say, oh, you know, I think maybe this person is having trouble, or I'm worried that they might not be ready in time for this test, uh, if they have the, amount of the, the attention to actually devote to looking at each student. Um, so we look at what do students know, how likely are they to achieve their goals, and what can I do to help them? These are all things that um, we're looking to empower different educational stakeholders, which includes teachers, students, and publishers, and many others. Um, so you can imagine something like this requires a fair amount of data science. If you're actually going to build a product that does any of these things, uh, you need to hire at least a few data scientists. Um, and uh, so what are the data that we're working with? Um, so we have learners. Um, we've had roughly 4 million students on the platform in the past year and a half. Um, 
They've generated billions of student events, contextualized by first content. We have over 200 textbooks that have been um, described to our system, um, formalized as knowledge graphs, which I'll go into more in a second. Um, and, uh, and finally, educational goals, which are a former articulation of the uh, needs and uh, constraints that are present in an educational environment. So an um, example of this might be a teacher saying, I want a particular student to know uh, these things by uh, two weeks from now um, at this level of mastery. Um, so those are the kind of the, some of the core entities that we're working with. Um, and so if we move on to the, dig in a little bit more to knowledge graphs. Um, this is a formal representation of educational content. It's composed of atoms. It's just like the smallest um, unit that we can kind of break educational content into. So that might be like a paragraph or a section or whatever makes sense for whatever we're working with. Um, and then concepts, which are groupings of those, which uh, cohesive subgroupings. Um, that makes sense to a subject matter expert. Um, and, then, and then we actually formalize the relationships between those. So prerequisite relationships, containment relationships, other things like that. So from a data science perspective, one way to think about this, and this is the way I think about it, um, is that this graph is actually encoding expert prior belief about the structure of knowledge. Um, so it's just a well-structured prior to, to, to a lot of the models that we're working with. Um, so here's an example of one of those graphs. Uh, this is like, I think, seventh grade something. Uh, but basically, we have uh, nodes in a graph, um, prerequisite relationships that are encoded, concepts that are there. Um, the good thing is, is, because this is just a prior belief, this is where we start, it's the starting place. We have this massive search space. We don't know where to go. So we start here. Um, we can actually refine the view of this graph algorithmically. Um, uh, here, we've done some hierarchical agglomerate of clustering uh, to detect the relationships between pieces of content using performance data. Um, so I have a video for you to kind of see what is actually going on with... Um, how do I get this up? Okay. All right. Oh, there it is. All right. Can you guys see that? All right. So, okay, great. Um, so what, what you're seeing here is this is a uh, time lapse. Um, students, uh, the little uh, white tick marks that are kind of scurrying all over the screen. Um, this is a, a knowledge graph with all the pesky uh, edges, which make it hard to, to look at. Um, but what you can see uh, is probably what most relevant about this is, is that we have uh, students kind of hopping between different concepts within uh, a particular course. And um, there's a lot of, of unique pathing going on and unique pacing, which I think are both really critical aspects to um, what some of the promise of adaptive recommendations actually brings to the market. Uh, so moving on to the other video, which is... Um, on the next slide. Um, so the next slide, <laughs> I have a phantom controlling this computer. So we close this one. I'll just, I'll just dictate. All right, yeah, there we go. And we play that video. Excellent job, computer. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, all right, so this video um, is actually, we're drilling down into what's going on with a single student. And this is really exciting. Um, so the, again, we have concepts, uh, a concept graph here. Um, what's going on? Students interacting with uh, various pieces of content. And we're constantly updating our view of student, uh, students' ability on each of these concepts. Oh, no. Where did it go? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, so the hexagon size has to do with our, our inference about how time intense we actually think it'll take the student to, to work through that material. And then the, the hexagon color is our estimate of the student's ability. Um, and you, as you can see, like, as time is going through, we're, we're constantly updating all these models. And we're using that to drive judgments about what they should be doing next and also drive these, uh, the analytics that, we, that, we, that we're providing. 
So we can move on to the next slide, computer. I appreciate it. Thanks. Um, so, oh, right, I need my clicker, though. Um, so uh, all, all this kind of filters into our inferential products. And we'll talk, uh, so proficiency answers the question, how well does a student know something? We have engagement, say like how likely is a student to quit working uh, with that educational content? Uh, we have recommendations, which you've seen a little bit of. What should the student do next? Something we call readiness forecast, which is just, is the student on track to meet the goals that have been articulated? Um, content efficacy is a big one for publishers. Like, how much actual learning does uh, a, a learner being exposed to my content actually provide? Um, and, and a lot more. Um, and these are all really exciting. Um, it's part of the reason why we have such a large team, because we work tackling a large space and a lot of interesting problems in it. Um, so hopefully everyone's looking at this and saying, oh, wow, this sounds awesome. Um, but a totally relevant follow-up question, does any of it actually help? Um, and you know, being, uh, being good scientists, in addition to data scientists, we want to know the answer to this as well. So we're constantly doing internal observational studies and um, randomized control stu uh, studies with our partners. Um, I'll talk a little bit in a second about why that is harder to do than you'd expect. Um, but um, at one of our largest partners, we've seen um, nearly half a grade improvement as usage of adaptive assignments uh, increases. So this is uh, pretty significant, something we're really excited about, um, and we'll continue to keep everyone posted as we get more information on that. So um, I want to talk uh, a little more generally about uh, data science and Newton um, and the challenges uh, that we are that we're experiencing in this space that I think might be relevant for some of the things you guys are are dealing with here um, in 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 your own work, your own your own companies, um, your own spaces. So, what is challenging about data science within the realm of education technology? Um, so, first, human behavioral data is uh, really complex and really messy. Um, as an example, uh, if you just wanted to estimate something as simple as wh how, like whether or not a, a, a student was using an educational product, um, you might say, all right, well, I'm going to look at the, the stream of data that they're generating as they're working with this web app. And I say, like, oh, well, you know, what, what did they spend the last 15 minutes on? Um, were they sitting there thinking really hard about this particular item, like racking their brain, trying to, trying to, trying to learn what's going on? Or... Were they downstairs making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? Um, so uh, I would love to know the answer to this question. Um, and we can kind of guess at it um, based on the patterns the students are uh, exhibiting as they're working. But it's really hard to answer it uh, in any real way because um, we don't know. We're not there in the room with the students like actually looking to see, oh, uh, no, they, they, they are, in fact, making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich while reading the textbook. So maybe it's both. I don't know. Um, but it's really hard. Um, another challenge, this is just a Bayesian loss function, um, uh, validation is also challenging for a lot of the models that we're working with. Um, so as a, as a trivial example, something that's easy, proficiency, estimating student proficiency, relatively straightforward, we can validate that because we actually see that the model itself predicts outcomes. And so we can, we can actually just say, like, oh, well, how, did, how well did we do at actually predicting what, what the student is actually going to respond? And, and we get a direct feedback on that model. If you look at student engagement, it becomes a little trickier um, because there's, there's not a direct observation of student engagement, but we can formalize some notions like, oh, well, what, it, what, would, what are the behavior patterns that we would expect from an engaged student? And then, and then see if uh, the model that we created to measure engagement seems to, to identify those things uh, in the way that we'd, we'd like it to. Um, Another type of challenge in validation with recommendations, for example, is time scale in terms of where the feedback loop comes back. So with recommendations, uh, we might want to be optimizing uh, outcomes at, at varying time scales. So it might be what happens, uh, how well the student is prepared for uh, the next piece of material they're going to be exposed, for, exposed to. Or it might be how well they're prepared for the assignment they have due at the end of the week or how well they do in the class as a whole. Um, there's lots of different time horizons that we might want to optimize on, um, which, which makes uh, uh, validating recommendations and understanding the, the performance characteristics challenging. Um, and then finally, 
we are building a platform, which kind of just complicates all the, th the things I've just said. Um, so all the models that we build have to generalize across a variety of educational experiences. So you can imagine if I had a model that, 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 that took uh, Apple as an input parameter, um, I really want that, that model to be robust to working with Granny Smith apples versus Washington versus Macintosh versus any number of other ones. Because um, what I care about is the appleness that I'm working with and not the details of the color. Um, and so the models, that we, they have to be generalizable across educational experiences. Um, and, and also, because we're a platform, we have to coordinate with partners um, to actually impact users. And so this gets back to what I was saying before about some of the challenges of, of, of running uh, control studies. We actually require explicit and, 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 and inv uh, investment by our partner to actually run those studies to do the more detailed investigation. Um, so what does this mean uh, for what we look for in data scientists? Um, so we have the standard set, um, which uh, math, stats, software engineering. Um, but one thing that, that the, the fact that we're a platform uh, uh, is that we're looking for people with ontological skill. What does that mean? Basically, we're looking for people who can uh, reason about and formalize the world in a, in a, in a relatively general way. Um, because we are a platform, we need to generalize those models. We need entities to work with that are also general and core. Um, and something that I, I personally really value in the people that I hire is something I call data empathy. And it's a skill. Um, I think uh, the, the, the addition that, that uh, Drew would, would add to the standard set is subject matter expertise. Um, for us, it's, it's really data empathy. And what that means uh, to us is it's an ability to reason about the qualitative context in which data is born or born. Um, and, and so what that means is that, that you know, I may not know a lot about the subject domain that I'm in, but I can, I can put myself in the world, in the person that might be sitting at that computer generating that thing, and I can reason relatively well about what's going on with them. Um, and it aids with structuring models, identifying confounders, and really productively interacting with non-quantitative subject matter experts. Um, like I said, it's not domain knowledge. Um, so what does this mean for our inferential product team structure? Uh, so this is something, this is a structure that we've used really heavily internally. Um, so data scientists engaged in the activities you expect them to be engaged in, they're prototyping models, they're working with software engineers to, uh, to implement those models. Uh, engineers are preoccupied with optimization um, and scaling. Um, and the SMEs are providing a lot of, of, of qualitative insight to the data scientists and validation to the, the software product that's being generated, al along with doing their own domain research. And so you might be like, oh, this looks a lot like Conway's Venn diagram. But I think what's important for us is that it's not only, it's not only the skills that are present within the data scientist, but also the skills that are present in the project team. Um, because the data scientist needs to be able to work closely with software engineers, so they need that software engineering background. And they need to be, work, be able to work closely with the, with the subject matter experts. So they really need that, um, what I call data empathy, that ability to reason about that, that problem space and communicate well with them. Um, so wrapping up. Uh, so yeah, we use, we use these team structures to build what I think are really exciting data products. Um, in, a, in a general and scalable way, uh, in a space that I, that I personally find very, very important, and I think uh, a lot of people in the world find very important, education. Um, and more generally, I'm really excited to see what education looks like in five years. Uh, there, are, there are tons of awesome players in the space right now, and uh, I just personally, I think that, that really great things are coming, and I can't wait. So uh, thanks for your time. Thanks a lot, Jesse. We have one question over there. Uh, Andy Beveridge. I'm a professor at Queens College. I'm also a CEO of Social Explorer. Well, the question I have really is a, I'm sort of a challenging you. Why do you assume that you can have a platform that goes across so many domains? I mean, you know, for example, 
listening to the prior speaker, they were talking about the kind of skill set that you need to, you know, to move from uh, physics, et cetera, over into data science, which is really a problem-solving skill set. Yeah. Whereas most of the things that you, most of the sort of like semi-examples that you gave were really on learning this or that fact it's looked like or fact or concept, but not necessarily applying it. So I just, in having worked in, we have, you know, full disclosure, we have a contract with Pearson Publishing. I don't really believe that you can go across these domains with a platform necessarily, and I'd like you to speak on that. Sure, sure. So when you say go across domains, um, can, do you mean, um, like, can I, le can I leverage uh, data from one domain to benefit students in another, or? No, no, like you have a, don't, you know, you have like a so-called platform that's supposed to work, let's say take history or l literature, and it's also supposed to work in math. I see, I see. So, right, uh, so this gets to the, what, the, the way we've structured the models and, and our formalization of the knowledge space is it, it's meant to be um, domain agnostic. Now, um, where that where that comes in where we're modeling content is at the conceptual level and the and the requisite relationships that exist between those those pieces of content. Now, um, I've heard people talk about uh, so there's like highly structured domains like um, math where you have like oh you, you have long sequences of, of requisite materials um, that make sense it's like oh well it, yeah you, you have a web of, of of requisite information that you need to to acquire to be able to do um, later things, um, and, but, but, and they say, well, what about what about something like history, um, and where it's just like mainly memorization or, or 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 something like that. And I I hated history because it was taught like it was memorization. And one of the things I, I wished it was taught like um, was as a as a sequence of of intimately related events in the world, and and I wouldn't have been able to understand. The unfolding of 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 you know the uh, people throwing tea in in the Boston Harbor without understanding um, the the events that 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 propagated that forward and and so for me like even in, a, in something like history um, it still uh, fits in that that formalization of like to really understand what's going on there is re there is requisite knowledge that you need. And um, and that's and that's where we're trying to model uh, the content that we're working with. And so, I guess it's a, what the question is what, whether or not you buy that there there exists re requisite relationships in content, and whether respecting those in terms of content delivery is beneficial. And and our stance is that it is beneficial, and it's actually relatively ubiquitous. One one more here. Who is this gentleman right here? Thank you. Claire Wyckoff, I'm at NYU. <laughs> and I was curious to know a little bit more about the populations that you're testing with, uh, what kinds of school systems uh, and age ranges. So testing with or, or that well, are actually using, that are, you're using? Yeah. Sorry, the test? The, the schools that are using. Oh, that are using. Yeah. Um, what range so, of demographics? So we have, um, we're deployed in, uh, uh, higher education institutions um, po power a lot of Pearson publisher books, um, mm -hmm. which are in a lot of higher ed. Um, also, we, we actually just uh, launched a product with Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, which has uh, uh, K-12. Mm -hmm. um, so we're actually in both now. Um, mm -hmm. And we've signed a number of deals recently that push us internationally as well. Mm -hmm. Public, private? Uh, wherever wherever those uh, those publishers are are, are are pushing their products, so mm -hmm. so um, yeah. There's no there's no limitation. We, we don't actually have control over where those are, are being focused because we're enabling the the publisher's product to be. Uh, so they're putting them into the system. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. okay. Thanks. Thank you. Time for one one last one, maybe the gentleman right here. Hi, Kevin Noonan from Surpass Digital. I was just going to ask you, and she kind of. Touched on that. How you make? How do you make money? And who are your customers? Yeah. Um, so. Um, so it's about our customers. Science. It's not about money. It's yeah. <laughs> well, I, th I think you know the, it's 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 an important question because real change in the education space has to be sustainable, 
and, uh, and sustainability comes from economic viability. Uh, and so we, we absolutely do have a, a, a very strong um, business approach. And I, it's one that, it's actually one of the things that really attracted me to Newton. It was, like, it was like, oh, I can come to Newton. I can do exciting, work on exciting work, uh, work on problems that I think are important, but also have a shot at them being out in the world and actually doing something useful because we have a business approach that I think is, is very viable. And that, that comes from the platform enabling these giants in the education space who have huge amounts of content that are, are just kind of like being made passively available. Um, we're working with them and we're, we're uh, basically providing a value add for every time a piece of that content gets distributed. And so, um, so we, t we, we might take a cut of the textbook sale, um, which is a digital textbook um, or, or real textbook sale if there's a digital component to it, um, or uh, a cut of the actual, uh, of a class that's being powered by a product that Newton is, is powering. So, um, so yeah, that's how we make our money. Good stuff. Thanks. Great, thank you. I think that's all the time we have. Thanks, Thanks. Jesse.